We got her out through a blanket over her head to all the smoke. Tonight, they escaped from a fire only to land in a state of homelessness. Our rights are, 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 are protected, and that way of life must be protected. And an East Coast Mi'kmaq band says no to a gold mine in their hunting grounds. Good evening and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. The Williams Lake First Nation in B.C. has released a preliminary report into their investigation at the former St. Joseph, St. Joseph's Mission Residential School. APTN's Tina House has this story and a warning. Some viewers may find the information disturbing. Hi, From 1891 to 1981, hundreds of Indigenous kids were forced to attend the St. Joseph's Mission Residential School in Williams Lake, B.C. And like many other residential schools across Canada, there were many stories about the abuse suffered by those children. And until now, they were just stories. But today, the Williams Lake First Nation announced their painful findings in phase one of their Thank investigation you, into unmarked graves found near the former residential school. This journey has led our investigation team into the darkest recesses of human behavior. Our team has recorded not only stories involving the murder and disappearance of children and infants, they have listened to countless stories of systemic tor systematic torture, starvation, rape, and sexual assault of children at St. Joseph's Mission. Visibly emotional, Chief Sellers went on to tell the story of an escape attempt. In 1902, three children ran away from the school as a result of these conditions. One of those children died. He was eight years old. He died from exposure freezing to death alone and outside while attempting to escape the physical and sexual abuses of the St. Joseph's Mission. His name was Duncan Sticks. The Williams Lake First Nation says that after the horrific discovery in Kamloops and the 215 kids found there, they embarked on their own investigation, which began nine months ago. It was funded by the provincial and federal government. By using state-of-the-art technology to search 470 hectares of land. To date, approximately 14 hectares of a total 470 have been subject to geophysical investigation. The area completed to date is represented in solid red on the map above. Ground penetrating radar is used to send radar pulses into the ground. The GPR unit then reflects off of buried objects. The result is called a reflection. To date, 93 reflections have been recorded at the St. Joseph's Mission. All of them display varying char characteristics indicative of potential human burials. The investigators say there was a historic cemetery in that area, and current data suggests that at least 50 are not associated with the cemetery, and the only way to identify if those reflections are actual human remains is to excavate. Grand Chief Stuart Phillips says he was heartbroken and angered when he heard the report. I think the worst is yet to come in terms of these discoveries. And I think we need to be clear, these are not unmarked graves, they're hidden graves. They were de deliberately concealed by the Catholic Church, the residential school officials, the RCMP and the uh, governments were complicit. Uh, in this uh, genocidal act. Back at the press conference, Any Chief Sellers questions? continued to reveal more disturbing details. The priests have been implicated during the investigation in numerous additional sexual assaults on children as young as seven years old. Stories of gang rape and molestation have become part of the fabric of the institution's history. So common as one survivor relates that if the school intercom requested a child to attend the office, you knew someone was about to be raped. At 15 years old, Ray Hans got into a bit of legal trouble. He was given the choice of either spending three months in jail or go to St. Joseph's Mission Residential School. 
he chose the school, but soon regretted that decision. I remember the girls, uh, you know, wouldn't go anywhere by themselves. I mean, you know, there'd be ten of them, uh, you know, and they'd be looking, uh, you know, all over the place and stuff like that while they were walking around. And, you know, especially on Sundays when we used to, you know, be able to go out for, uh, you know, walks and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, you hear kids crying in the middle of the night, you know, you wonder why. And uh, I don't think anybody really, uh, you know, investigated or uh, got too concerned when, uh, you know, when other students didn't show up. They just assumed that they were uh, taken to a different school. Are you shocked to hear the findings today that they have found potentially 93 unmarked graves there and just 14 hectares of land? Not shocked at all. As a matter of fact, uh, I think there's a heck of a lot more. The investigation at the former St. Joseph's Mission Residential School continues. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. The National Indian Residential School Crisis Line is available for survivors and others who might need support. That number is 1-866-925-4419. And we want to hear what you think about the report and findings by the Williams Lake First Nation. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. A Mi'kmaq community hopes to stop a modern-day gold rush as one of three proposed gold mines in Nova Scotia is on their traditional hunting lands. Angel Moore has the story. Millbrook First Nations Satellite Reserve is called Beaver Lake. It's located about 100 kilometers northwest of Halifax, near what is considered a traditional hunting ground. But an open-pit gold mine is being proposed by the Australian gold mining company St. Barbara. It operates the only open pit gold mine in Nova Scotia, with plans to develop two more in addition to the Beaver Dam site. It's currently undergoing an environmental impact assessment, but Millbrook Chief Bob Glode fears the new mine will disrupt hunting practices and says treaty rights are not for sale. Our rights are, 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 are protected, and that way of life must be protected. Uh, and those are things that you cannot replace by any amount of gold that's in that ground. All right, we need to step aside for a short break, but still to come. Residents in Prince Rupert were displaced by an apartment fire a month ago, and they still have no place to go. So we had to run by the fire, and then when we stepped on the top step, all the windows and everything blew out. Welcome back to APTN National News. In Prince Rupert, British Columbia, residents displaced by an apartment fire a month ago still have no place to go. This week, their temporary housing comes to an end, and advocates for fire victims are calling on the government to address the issue of affordable housing. APTN's Lee Wilson reports. Rhonda Bolton and Robin Russ describe how they narrowly escaped a fire at Angus Apartments in Prince Rupert in late December. Bolton was visiting her sister, Irma Bolton, who is an elder and needed a wheelchair for mobility. She said they heard the fire alarm, but it was only when someone banged on their door to get out of the building, they knew it was a real emergency. And we got her out, threw a blanket over her head to all the smoke we couldn't see in the hall. And we had to run by the actual fire, because that's right in the front and we were a bit past her. So we had to run by the fire, and then when we stepped on the top step, all the windows and everything blew out. The Prince Rupert Fire Department said the cause of the fire is still undetermined. But in November, a month before the fire, the BC Residential Tenancy Branch filed a penalty against building owners over compliance failures on safety repairs. Numerous complaints are listed in the penalty against owners Pierre Wong and Hu Feng Wong. Photos before the fire from inside the apartment show the walls covered with spray paint and a building in poor condition. In May, the City of Prince Rupert contacted the Residential Tenancy Branch with concerns. In a letter they stated, Currently, there is no front door on the property and several of the windows have plywood covering them. 
with them even being occupied by residents. Angus apartment owner Pierre Wong provided a statement to APTN National News stating there is a power imbalance with a residential tenancy branch. The tenants have all the power. The landlord has no power. I installed sprinkler systems, repaired doors, windows for them to be broken again by tenants and people allowed into the building. I have no way to recover the costs even when the tenant stops paying rent. Danielle Gentile, a Niskau woman who lives in Prince Rupert, wanted to do something to help displaced fire victims as her family was displaced from Kitimat a few years ago. Along with community members, she decided to collect donations and the local hotel offered space. I started a fundraiser and um, many members of the community stepped up and just started donating money. We did a clothing drive um, and the Highliner was a very, very, very helpful as they provided us a room, a donation room. Emergency Services BC, Canadian Red Cross, and BC Ministry of Social Services all contributed fire victims to stay at a hotel. For nearly a month, Gentile has advocated for and tried to help find new rentals without success. She built a bond with fire victim and elder Irma Bolton, who she described as kind-hearted and strong-willed. She passed away last week. Irma and I um, grew very close and um, her health was diminishing. Um, before the fire happened. However, the stress of the fire and being displaced, I'm sure, had great effect and we lost Irma yesterday morning. The stay in the hotel ends this Friday and most residents have not found new rentals. Rhonda Bolton and Robin Russ say they see rentals, but they are refused because they're on social assistance. They've been here three years trying to get places and we can't get a place because we don't have like a full-time job and we're just on social assistance or whatever. And it's like real hard to even hear anything. Like we contacted the city of Prince Rupert about the displaced residents. They did not respond to our emails. North Coast MLA Jennifer Rice's office did not provide a statement before airtime. Gentile is raising concerns over the lack of affordable housing in Prince Rupert. She thinks more needs to be done more community involvement on all levels from provincial, federal, community members to show up at council meetings. But we really need strong voices for, for this matter as nothing will get done if no one says anything. Displaced residents are being directed to a BC government program that can provide funding to relocate to another city. Bolton and Russ plan to remain and stay with family and friends. Leah Wilson, AP10 National News, Prince Rupert. Recent problems at Saskatoon's largest homeless shelter may be just the latest sign of a system ready to crack. It's the first winter since the government changed how the most vulnerable get supports, and it's driving up the number of people needing shelter. Frontline workers say they need help. APTN's Leanne Sanders has the story. The lighthouse has been bursting at the seams with people needing a warm place to stay this winter. Outreach worker Jonathan Mercury, who once lived in the lighthouse, says it's really tough for everyone. If I had a voice for everybody, that's what we're trying to get done right now is um, get a like uh, get everybody to be able to voice their concerns and try to fix everything right now. And the lighthouse is trying to fix a lot of things. A fire in December, followed by orders from the fire department to fix safety issues, including the fire alarm and sprinkler systems, and clearing fire exits, have compounded problems created by COVID. Director of Client Services Whitney Fraser says they're stretched very thin. We have not, like many shelters, um, diminished our capacity or um, who we've been able to take um, and and we have tried to continue to do that even without the extra resources and funding as well as just keeping up with the demand in the community with the increase in homelessness as well as um, just struggling with the opioid crisis. And even stretched thin, the lighthouse is working to fix the safety issues. Assistant Fire Chief Yvonne Raymer with the Saskatoon Fire Department says she's seen progress. We work closely with the shelters as much as possible and we support them to the best of our ability because this is our vulnerable population and they need to be safe. But pressures on the lighthouse are likely to continue.
Police Patrol Superintendent Cameron McBride says the situation has been escalating since last summer when social assistance clients began receiving funds directly to pay their rent themselves. And due to complex needs or life circumstances, they uh, have not been able to pay their rent. And so that results in an eviction. And now we've got a larger number of individuals who find themselves without any place to go, coupled with cold weather and that seasonal effect that we see every year. And so definitely, I think it's uh, creating a strain on the service providers who are trying to provide a warm place. McBride says he's aware of talks surrounding how recipients get their assistance to hopefully alleviate the pressure which has impacted other services like fire and police. But it also creates an environment where we have more people in smaller spaces and that creates uh, an environment where we receive more social disorder kind of calls. The shelter was dealt another blow last Friday when its executive director was dismissed. Two board members have taken over, but managers and staff have signed a letter asking for a provincial dispute resolution specialist to step in. In an emailed statement, Social Services said the minister wasn't available to speak about the Lighthouse's human resources issues, saying it's an autonomous organization. Meanwhile, Jonathan Mercury says it's just a tough situation for everyone. Trying to keep everybody happy is a very big challenge. You know, we've, we are so overwhelmed with so much stuff that it's so hard to keep everybody happy. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Saskatoon. Elders in Calgary will soon have a sacred place to call home. That's because an elders lodge is being built in the city. It's part of a provincial program aimed to build affordable housing for Indigenous people. Tamar Pimentel has this report. Shovels are in the ground and construction is underway of Calgary's first ever Indigenous Elders Lodge. The future building is a collaboration between the federal and provincial governments, Calgary's Aboriginal Friendship Centre and of course local elders like Jackie Bromley. We carry the life stories and lived experience of our ancestors and those who have preserved so that our generations can live life in a good way. The Lodge will create a safe place to practice land-based teachings, hold ceremonies, and provide a garden of traditional medicines. And it will house up to a dozen elders, which Calgary MP George Chahal says is crucial, especially during the pandemic. This pandemic has underscored and worsened the housing challenges faced by too many Canadians. And the hardest hit by this crisis are the most vulnerable. The nearly $6 million building is part of Alberta's Indigenous Housing Capital Program, which focuses on building affordable housing outside and inside Indigenous communities. For Sarah Sinclair of the Friendship Centre, this lodge is about preserving Indigenous teachings. Without them, we couldn't continue as a culture, as a family, as a community. The project will welcome residents in February of 2023. Tamara Pimentel, APTI National News, Calgary. All right, it's time for the final break of the night, but still ahead. Today's In Focus highlights may make you want to order a pizza. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Matt Groening of Kakustal First Nation was able to get a photo of a visiting fox that tried to get too close to, his, to Matt's lunch. Matt says when he's out working on the land, these things can happen. Well, certainly stay safe when you're out there, Matt. Be sure to send us your great photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be featured as our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. We start over in the east, minus 5 in St. John's and minus 10 in Sun and Fredericton. Minus 14 in Happy Valley Goose Bay and minus 17 in Cartwright. 
minus 12 in Quebec City and minus 7 in Montreal. Minus 7 in snow in London and minus 6 in snow in Sault Ste. Marie. Minus 5 in snow in Elliott Lake and snow in minus 22 in Big Trout Lake. Snow in minus 25 in Churchill and minus 12 in Thompson. Minus 5 in snow in Barron's River and 0 degrees in snow in Winnipeg. Snow in 0 in Swift Current and more snow in minus 6 in Saskatoon. Minus 4 in Meadow Lake and minus 20 in Stony Rapids. Over in the west, a minus 11 in snow in Fort Chippewan and minus 6 in Fort McMurray. Minus 2 in Red Deer and plus 6 in Calgary. Plus 9 in Tofino and plus 1 in Bella Coola. Minus 3 in Smithers and minus 5 in Dees Lake. Minus 4 in Snow and Whitehorse and minus 34 in Old Crow. Minus 29 in Yellowknife and minus 20 in Snow and Norman Wells. Minus 33 in Colville Lake and minus 28 in Fort McPherson. Minus 26 in Arviat and minus 30 in Baker Lake. Minus 33 in Resolute and minus 24 in Snow in Iqaluit. Today we put pizza in focus and that generated a lot of response from everyone. So many people sent in photos of their pizzas on social media, it was hard to keep up. From Anthony, his cousin Joshua from Lake St. Martin is known as the Pizza Man. He can make 10 or more pizzas with his wife and sons. Jenner shared a deadly homemade pizza, one half veggie with peppers, tomato, mushroom, and the other half cheese. Here's one from Caitlin, an indigenous lawyer by day and foodie and pizza maker by night. Bev in Watson Lake makes these Greek pizzas to order. And here's a homemade pizza from Roberta in Carcross, Yukon, which features lots of cheese and sausage. Now I filled in for Melissa Ridgen and asked the Bernard family who made the best pizza. Fingers were pointed, but Amber Bernard says her mom, Tina Bernard. The family, including Dad Leonard, just opened Sky Mountain Pizza in their home community of Wagoma First Nation, Nova Scotia. Have a listen. I have to ask, out of the three of you, who makes the better pizza? I don't want to cause any trouble here, but uh, I, I got to ask it. Here. Amber's not in the room. She can't point at us. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's my mom. My mom has been the powerhouse behind this business. She's the one that's been working so hard for months to bring this to reality. She's the pizza maker. She makes the best pizza. And all of Mi'kmaq, I want to say bravely. <laughs> that's wait a minute. Um, Hold on. You're causing a fight now. It's a tribal war. We don't need that. <laughs> Sasquatch I don't approved. want that. <laughs> To all the grandmas and aunties out there, we all do the best. <laughs> <laughs> for you tonight unfortunately there is no pizza here for me to sample so i guess i'll just have to order some for dinner for news anytime you can check out our website at aptnnews.ca i'm daryl stranger thank you for joining us and have a great night